This is Duke University. I'm Stuart Benjamin again. I'm talking only in my capacity as a Duke Law Professor. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the chairman of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, uh, standing over here. Um, he's had an extraordinary career. I'll just hit the, the highlights. He graduated from Columbia College and Harvard Law School, um, both magna cum laude in law school. He was co-notes editor of the Harvard Law Review. Uh, he worked in Congress for then Representative Charles Schumer and on the um, Iran, sorry, on the staff of the House Select Committee investigating the Iran-Contra affair. He clerked for then Chief Judge Abner Mikva, uh, retired Justice William Brennan, and uh, Justice David Souter. He served as special counsel at the FCC to uh, then general counsel, later Chairman William Kennard, and he also uh, then was chief counsel to Chairman Reed Hunt. From there, he moved into the private sector, was at um, IAC Interactive Corp from 97 to 2005. And after that, uh, he co-founded, what was it, LaunchBox, Digital, and Rock Creek Ventures, and probably one or two others that I'm forgetting, and was a special advisor at a company called General Atlantic. And then in 2009, he became chairman of uh, the FCC, um, where uh, he, he's made at least uh, one mistake, which was to bring me in, but maybe that, that's the only one of any great significance. Um, so he thought the uh, most interesting idea for this event would be for us to have a conversation. So the idea is um, I'm going to ask him questions. If you have questions you, want, you suggest, please email that address or write them down on these little cards and send them forward. So I'll be the funnel of I have a few questions to start us with, but I'm sure there'll be uh, many more. So he's just going to talk just for a minute or two to say hello, and then we'll sit down and do questions. Without any further ado, Julius. Uh, well, I really don't have anything prepared, which is uh, probably a good thing with the kind of incredibly talented audience we have here. Uh, I won't go through all the names of people I saw on the last panel and asking questions, but uh, I'll tell you students that uh, uh, Stuart and Phil and the others who've organized this have really brought together some of the best uh, minds thinking about these very hard issues. Um, and I have been lucky to uh, both know Stuart for a long time and to have had a chance to work with him at the FCC for the last couple of uh, years. And um, uh, it's just such an important thing for uh, people who think about areas like this to spend time in public service. Uh, I know we have here uh, someone who teaches here who was the chief economist at the FCC. Uh, there's uh, another brilliant professor here who's uh, taken on uh, some work now at the Federal Trade Commission. This is very, very important. Uh, I think it's important to bring into uh, agencies and government people uh, from the academy, uh, also people from lots of different uh, disciplines. Uh, Chris and I were just talking about this a few minutes ago. It's so important in the areas that we work on to have people uh, with engineering uh, training, uh, to have economists, to have historians, uh, uh, to have uh, people with uh, actual practice uh, uh, in business uh, or in nonprofits that are affected by the kinds of things that we do. Uh, and I see some of that reflected here. I'm happy to support it and be part of it. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to the questions. I think the only, uh, uh, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, myself a question and, uh, and answer it, and then I'll sit down and take questions from other people. So, uh, so uh, uh, you know, uh, so uh, what do you think, me, or is at the highest level is the, you know, the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge that we face right now uh, uh, as a country in the area that, uh, that I have something to do with. And, um, uh, I am, you know, as many of you are, uh, so incredibly um, excited about the opportunities uh, of the broadband infrastructure that we see rolling out in the United States. Wired and wireless, uh, high speed, potentially connecting everyone. Um, as a way for us as the United States to lead the world in innovation, to lead the global economy in the 21st century as we did in the 20th, 
That will only happen if we seize the opportunities of this extraordinary platform. And the good news is we're as well positioned as any country to do that. Uh, we have the best and most incredible entrepreneurial spirit in uh, the world, uh, uh, the most incredible uh, innovators, um, a whole series of head starts uh, and advantages, uh, an incredible education system. Uh, but we also have uh, a number of very important challenges, not all of which I'm going to summarize here. Um, but one of the main challenges is that when it comes to broadband deployment and adoption, we're just not where we need to be as a country. Um, there's still uh, about 20 to 24 million Americans who live in parts of the country that just have no broadband infrastructure at all. Even if they um, uh, wanted to sign up, they couldn't. It's just not there. Um, we have uh, over 30% of the country who could get broadband um, but hasn't signed up. Uh, so it's about a 68% penetration rate. What does that mean? Um, you know, uh, well, Singapore is at 90%. Um, you know, if you consider this uh, a basic platform for participating in our economy, participating um, uh, in our democracy, a basic platform for innovation, it's just not good enough. We have a long way to go. Uh, and then we have some other challenges that uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, as we get into it, Spectrum Universal Service. Um, but I wanted to tell you all about uh, one study that has impressed me uh, significantly in, in kind of shaping our uh, thinking about what the challenge is and why we have this challenge. Uh, many of you are familiar with the OECD studies that rank the U.S. 16th, 17th, 18th when it comes to broadband. Uh, th those studies have, uh, have issues. It's not exactly apples to apples, but the truth is you could apply whatever correction you want, and they do tell you that the U.S. isn't where uh, we should be. The study that I saw that I thought was the most telling was one that looked at 40 industrial countries and ranked them on a series of metrics that go to innovative capacity and competitiveness. And uh, not all of those metrics were communications broadband focus, but a number of them were. And that study placed the US out of 40 on a snapshot basis, sixth. So it said the US was sixth out of 40 on uh, innovation, innovative capacity and competitive ability, which is interesting when I tell people I see a little bit of this in the room. Some people hear that and they say, oh, six, that's better than we thought. But, you know, that's OK. It's not OK. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not even the Olympic podium. It's not good enough. And, you know, we're not going to lead the world in innovation. and We're not going to lead the global economy in the 21st century if we're sixth. But that's actually not what's most concerning about the study. What was most concerning about it is the study next looked at each of the metrics and measured rate of change. So it measured uh, the rate. All the countries were improving. So it was measuring rate of improvement in each of the metrics. And on that basis, it ranked the US 40th out of 40. And that's very scary, uh, scary for obvious reasons. I think it leads to things like um, something that happened uh, about a half a year ago, a company called uh, Applied Materials, major Silicon Valley company in the energy technology space, moving its CTO, its chief technology officer, and its technology operations from Silicon Valley to Beijing. You know, how many companies have to do that before we say, hmm, maybe we have a problem? Of course, by the time it's too many, it's, it becomes too late to solve some of these problems. I think, and this is my last point, and then I'll sit down, but the other thing about the study that I think was interesting and somewhat revealing about um, the challenges is um, in, in um, when I travel to other countries and meet my counterparts in other countries, I, I often sense among people um, in government in other countries more focus on broadband issues than I sense here. Um, and the study, I think, help ex helps explain a little bit uh, a level of dangerous complacency that we might have in the United States on this. Because, um, as I mentioned, the study reported that every country was improving. We are improving in the United States when it comes to broadband, wired and wireless. In some areas, we're improving uh, um, uh, it, it, you know, in an exciting way, and there's incredibly exciting things happening in the country right now. Um, what I think that 
many people miss is that the fact that we're improving alone is not good enough if uh, our competitors are moving faster. And uh, so by way of introduction at a high level, when we work on the things that we can do to promote a healthy, vibrant, innovative, economy growing, job producing broadband infrastructure in the United States. These are the kinds of things I keep in mind uh, and the compelling um, uh, uh, both opportunity and need we have uh, to fight for uh, the same leadership we had um, in the 20th century when it came to innovation and economic success to have that in the 21st century. So with that, I will be happy to take questions. Please sit down. All right. So. Um, First question I thought might be useful is, oh yeah, pass those cards up. Um, first question I thought might be useful is, so this is a pretty savvy audience. Um, are there? You didn't what, warn me about that. <laughs> what What are the things that are, are happening at at the commission that even this reasonably savvy audience doesn't really know about fully? Um, you might have sort of a glimmer about, but you know, what are the things that are going on? Sure. That, well, uh, we should. You know, I, the correct answer to that is probably what we're trying to get done on. Um, Spectrum, and um, uh, but I'll start with something that I'm sure no one here knows about, but it's an example of the kind of creative thing we're trying to do to promote um, a broadband economy, an innovation economy. Uh, when we were working on our national broadband plan last year, uh, we, we put together the first national broadband plan that the United States has ever had, not the first broadband plan that anyone has had in the world. We were not ahead of the pack on this. Um, but. Uh, you know, we looked at the full uh, ecosystem, um, and we looked, among other things, at a series of verticals where we saw incredible opportunities for uh, benefits uh, measured however you want to measure it. You know, and one, for example, is, uh, is health and technology. Uh, and the opportunities of uh, a fully distributed uh, uh, broadband infrastructure to help when it comes uh, to addressing some of our real health challenges in the country, like um, remote diagnostics, uh, uh, um, uh, remote doctor-patient visits, uh, using broadband, um, electronic monitoring for people with uh, uh, heart issues, kidney issues. I saw an incredible uh, example. I met the parents and a kid whose life was saved by um, uh, electronic monitoring of a heart uh, condition. Uh, in any event, as we were doing this work, and of course the other area where we're seeing a lot of really uh, interesting uh, uh, innovation, there's some companies here locally uh, developing uh, 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 applications that really help patients and doctors uh, efficiently uh, address health issues. And anyway, we were looking at this and we realized uh, we interacted with many other agencies of the government as we were doing this and we interacted with the Food and Drug Administration and saw that there were some people at the FDA who thought, uh, oh, uh, there are all these uh, medical-related, health-related device and devices and apps that are being developed. Uh, surely we need to review all of these at the FDA uh, to protect health and safety. Now, no one cares about health and safety more than I do. We all care about health and safety. But we were worried that um, maybe without adequately analyzing it, we would see um, uh, a set of new innovative applications, uh, for example, get swept up into an FDA process, which by its nature is long and, and, and rigorous. And we were worried that that might uh, 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 dampen investment in this area and delay the rollout of uh, products that, uh, uh, that shouldn't be in that process. And we reached out to the FDA. The commissioner of the FDA is this uh, uh, wonderful um, a talented woman named Peggy Hamburg, and um, and it led to the kind of discussion that you uh, would want to see happening in government, where we sat down, we talked about it, we compared notes, and ended up uh, holding the first ever joint public workshop between the FCC and the FDA, uh, signing a, uh, a joint statement of principles that, um, in addition to recognizing the importance of health and safety, uh, recognized the importance of innovation and investment and this kind of horizontal uh, 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 interaction between two agencies of government that have different expertise is, uh, uh, is producing and I think will produce positive results in terms of getting the line as right as possible between 
health-related communications devices and applications that don't need to go through an FDA review process and those that do. Just one example that I'm sure people don't uh, spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, I mention it in part because we're always open to sort of ideas and suggestions on how we can bring our expertise to bear um, uh, in ways that will promote common goals. Uh, but let's talk about Spectrum because um, it is a, uh, a major, major focus of ours. Uh, when, I, when we come back to the kind of studies that I talked about earlier and opportunities and challenges, there may be no greater area of opportunity than uh, over the next decade than mobile innovation. And we know this intuitively just looking at what's happening with uh, smartphones and tablets and many of you may have some familiarity with this uh, you know, really interesting um, uh, uh, innovation going on in machine to machine uh, uh, internet connected device that are wireless as well. All this incredibly exciting. Um, we're off in many respects to a great start in the US when it comes to this. Um, but we have the following challenge. Uh, the challenge is uh, we're running out of spectrum that's usable for mobile broadband. And the numbers look something like this. Uh, if you take the demand on spectrum that's projected to come over the next five years from smartphones and tablets and machine-to-machine -machine devices, um, the projections are about a 35 times increase over what we have now. Um, it sounds like a lot. It's actually, when you stop and think about it, it's really not that much. If you think about, um, I suspect everyone here has already gone from feature phone to smartphone, but if you think about the, uh, the, the demand on spectrum that your old feature phones used versus uh, the kind of data demands that your smartphones use, uh, 35X seems low, maybe. Uh, and by the way, these studies uh, that we did, in, uh, or that we got in connection with our National Broadband Plan a year ago, really were done before the tablet uh, really took off, before the iPad really took off. But let's play with the 35X number. The amount of spectrum uh, we have at the FCC that we can put online for mobile broadband represents about a two and a half or threefold increase over what we have now. Well, that's a scary gap. Um, it's a very scary gap. Uh, it would have been nice to discover that, you know, when you got to the FCC as chairman, there was some, you know, warehouse that you could open and there was the secret spectrum. You could put it on the market and be a hero. It doesn't work that way. And, and uh, it's been a while since uh, the value of spectrum was a secret. So we have just a very real challenge in how to close this gap. Um, and there's no one silver bullet. But one thing that uh, I, I think has become uh, obvious to a lot of people who have looked at it is that um, we need to look across spectrum that's being used, particularly spectrum that was allocated uh, a long time ago pursuant to, you know, kind of the old command and control way of allocating spectrum and say, is any of this um, uh, potentially being inefficiently utilized, underutilized? And, and if it were, what's an idea on how to free it up? And uh, we worked a lot on this. We talked to a lot of very smart people, including people at this room, and we developed uh, an idea called um, incentive auctions. Um, the US was the first country to do one-sided auctions of spectrum. It's now the dominant way that spectrum is put in the market. Um, uh, no one has ever done a two-sided auction of the sort that I'm mentioning, but I do think it's the next major policy innovation in this area. Uh, given that so much of the spectrum is occupied. Um, and the idea is that we would auction off spectrum for mobile broadband, where the supply of spectrum coming into that auction would come from existing license holders uh, who would be incentivized by receiving a portion of the proceeds that the auction would generate. Uh, this is a big, big topic and something we have to tackle uh, to meet the mobile opportunity in the country, and I'm happy to dig into it deeper with you, Stuart, if, if, if there was interest. Right, well, th yes, let me dig into that. I mean, so, it's we're great, we're talking about all this various spectrum out there, but there are, as you know, existing users of that spectrum, and so a lot of those existing users are gonna say, we got a better idea, why not just let us have more flexibility, and then you won't have to go through all this auction foolishness, right? You'll just give us the flexibility and be done with it. So in some places that may work, and in other places that will leave locked up uh, a lot of value and won't actually serve 
the needs of mobile broadband. So what's an example? Um, take broadcasting. Um, uh, now, the broadcasting story in the United States is actually a great success story, right? In the 20th century, we commercialized broadcast spectrum. We created uh, an important industry uh, that's provided a lot of value to people all over the country uh, that's become, you know, the, the uh, foundation for uh, the American content industry, which is a very important um, uh, uh, industry uh, in the U.S. measured by job creation, economic activity, and one of our biggest international exports. So what I'm going to say has nothing to do with um, uh, being negative on broadcasting, but this is talking about spectrum allocation. Um, one of the things that's happened since the time that we were kids is that uh, broadcast TV, uh, let's see, when I was a kid, uh, all the TV I watched, I watched through the over-the-air antenna that came into my house. Um, my 19-year-old, I think, probably has never watched TV, the same channels, over, uh, over the air broadcast spectrum. He watches it through cable or satellite. And in fact, a um, very large percentage of the country gets their TV uh, that way. Uh, and it, you know, I'm uh, uh, very interested in seeing broadcasters become multi-platform in, in various ways. Broadcast spectrum was allocated um, in an inefficient way from the start. Uh, if, you, if you look at the broadcast allocation in any market, it's a checkerboard of six megahertz channels with separations. And so there's 300 megahertz of spectrum allocated for broadcasting in each you know, market of the US. Uh, at the most, only half of it is used. And in fact, in many markets, a lot less is used because there are fewer channels. And so the way to Release, to free up the most spectrum for mobile broadband um, uh, is to do something that we've done before that we know works, which is to uh, uh, free up some spectrum through this incentive-based mechanism that I mentioned, uh, and then reorganize broadcast channels uh, to a place where we can free up contiguous spectrum uh, for an auction and also for potentially for additional unlicensed spectrum, et cetera. So it sounds complicated as I talk about it. You're going to help us simplify it. <laughs> well, I, well, well, I mean, I take your point. It's all these crazy allotments, and so there's a danger of holdout costs for, uh, on, the, on the part of incumbents. But then one response that you get is you know, you know, Tom Hazel, among others, have said, well, there's an easier way, which is just kick them off the spectrum, right? Forget about all this uh, incentive auction stuff. <laughs> Um, just clear the spectrum entirely, and then you can do anything you want with it. Well, I, I think, um, uh, you know, I'm a practical person, and, and I think that we don't have a lot of time to uh, spend before we take care of the spectrum crunch. And uh, to me, this particular framework that I outlined um, really is in the category of win-win-win. Uh, you know, it, it, it allows everyone to act rationally according to their incentives and end up having tremendous benefits for the public. Uh, and because of that, it should be the shortest distance between two points and a shorter distance than getting into battles uh, over um, uh, uh, taking spectrum back. Uh, so that's what we're focused on because, um, you know, if we can get, and we do need legislative authority to do this. Oddly, we have the authority to, um, uh, to take back spectrum. We have the authority to auction spectrum. We don't have the authority to share some of the proceeds of the spectrum to make it an incentive-based uh, process. So uh, I would like to see this work because I think it's the best answer for everyone involved. And how do we know, now to flip my last question, and how do we know any of this spectrum is better used for wireless broadband than for, for broadcasting? Well, th this, uh, uh, this particular approach would actually let the market decide that. So if, um, uh, if it turns out that uh, broadcasters, uh, uh, and, and by the way, we should talk in general about license holders because this could be applied to different license bands. But if it turns out that the uh, 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 existing license holders uh, value their spectrum more than a third party would pay for it in an auction, uh, particularly given the extra value that would be released by uh, uh, organizing the spectrum properly, 
then they would hold on to it. In fact, our expectation is that many broadcasters, in fact, most broadcasters, would continue to hold on to their spectrum. Uh, our goal in this effort is to free up about 100 megahertz of the 300 megahertz, which um, you know, is potentially about one-sixth of broadcasters because of the separations. But, um, but the market would determine it, and I think it's a healthy way to um, uh, make sure that the spectrum is being allocated for its um, highest and best use. And then one, one of the questions that's coming here, and, then, and what is the role uh, of unlicensed in all this? Well, unlicensed spectrum is just incredibly uh, important, an important part of the ecosystem. You know, anyone who now uh, goes back and forth between 3G and Wi-Fi can appreciate the uh, importance of, uh, 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 of unlicensed spectrum. Wi-Fi is unlicensed. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the, uh, uh, a, a truish story, I think this is true, of the, the history of Wi-Fi is very interesting. You know, as I mentioned, the uh, history of spectrum allocation at the FCC was uh, this command and control approach. You know, here's a block of spectrum. We have figured out exactly what it should be used for. We're going to allocate it exactly for that purpose. Uh, we're going to um, uh, distribute it for free by lottery or comparative hearing, and you know, and 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 boom. Anyway, for a long time there was a band of spectrum that uh, uh, people, the FCC couldn't figure out what to do with. It was surrounded by a lot of other uses, and so you couldn't use it at high power because there would be interference. So only low power uses would be good, and, uh, and there was just no idea. And the spectrum just sat there for year after year after year. Eventually, being became known as the the junk band uh, until. Uh, one day, finally, someone had an idea. And by the way, for, uh, for extra credit, if someone could tell me who this person was, I'd really <laughs> like to know. But someone said, why don't we just put this spectrum on the market um, as unlicensed spectrum? And we'll set power limits to make sure that there's no interference. And we'll make it clear that it's secondary. So if they are interfering, they're the ones who have to shut down or lower their power. And See what happens. You know, let innovators figure out what this can be used for. And um, and so someone came uh, up with the idea, and so it was done. And um, and lo and behold, uh, there came uh, first garage openers. You're all too young to remember garage openers, but um, you know, but using unlicensed spectrum. And then came baby monitors, uh, also on that spectrum. But eventually, uh, with some nudging from the government, uh, uh, some innovators uh, got together. Uh, developed the idea for what we now know as Wi-Fi, developed a standard, and um, on this unlicensed spectrum, created a, a literally a trillion dollar uh, industry that's playing such a vital role uh, in our ecosystem. And it's one of the reasons why earlier uh, this year we did the first uh, release of uh, unlicensed spectrum in 15 or 16 years, uh, higher quality spectrum than the Wi-Fi spectrum, which we hope will be um, one of the next great platforms for wireless innovation. Um, so let me ask you a, a, a question that's come in. Slightly unfair question, but... Um, <laughs> um, so when you think about your priorities for 2011, now I ask you to cast forward in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So 10 years from now, when you look back on the period, you know, 2009 to 2012, what do you think is the thing that people are going to say, wow, that really made a difference uh, in my life? Well, I, 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 uh, I don't know. And, and uh, you know, uh, but I, uh, I can tell you what we're working on now, which we think are the areas where we can have the most impact in uh, meeting the challenges that I set out at the beginning. Uh, one is the full spectrum agenda. Uh, incentive auctions are a part of it. There are a lot of other things uh, that we can do, are doing to unleash uh, spectrum and mobile innovation. Very, very important area. A second is transforming something called uh, the Universal Service Fund uh, together with something called intercarrier compensation. Um, uh, just to explain what this is about a little bit, we, um, uh, we have a, uh, a $9 billion a year fund that the FCC administers that for a long time has done a good job universalizing telephone service in the United States. Um, this program still wakes up every day and supports telephone service. Uh, it's obviously not what it should be doing. It should be waking up every day and efficiently supporting broadband service. 
Uh, and I say efficiently in part because not only is this program still supporting telephone service, it's doing it in many respects in an inefficient, sloppy, wasteful way. Um, uh, so transforming this fund, which has elements in it that um, uh, go to deployment, go to adoption, um, uh, is very, very important uh, and uh, can make a significant difference in you know, what one of uh, the goals we set in the National Broadband Plan was having the largest market in the world for uh, high-speed broadband by 2020. And, um, but, that's, but the dirty little secret of USF is that some people get subsidized and some people don't, right? So some people in rural areas are getting subsidies and others are not, which means in effect, the ones who are not getting subsidized are subsidizing those who, who do. And so this is why nobody's, this is why nothing has happened on USF for years and years. Well, this is, you know, the, the good news about you saying that is it's not a secret anymore. And, <laughs> and we've been trying hard to uh, let that cat out of the bag. And in fact, you're right. There is a rural, rural divide. And there are some parts of rural America that, um, uh, as a result of how the program has been ad administered, um, actually have a level of broadband, not that this is personal, but that's, well, that's better than what a lot of other people have in the community I happen to live in. Um, uh, but, you know, but, but there are some areas that have figured out how to do this, uh, and there are some areas where there are, uh, and by the way, the, the whole idea of this kind of program on the deployment side is a recognition that in certain markets, uh, in certain uh, geographic areas, uh, the market on its own won't support uh, telecommunications infrastructure because there's just not enough population density. And so I think for those areas, it does make sense to have the government play a role in this kind of public-private partnership here and say, all right, what will it take uh, from a government partnership to get a private company to provide basic telecommunication service in these areas? One of the ways that the program has gone wrong is that um, over the years, it's in, those, in some of those areas, uh, it's funded four or five or six different companies providing communication service, while in other parts of the country it's supporting none. So we have a very big challenge in making, converting the program to broadband, making it more efficient. Uh, we've, to discipline ourselves, we've said um, uh, we're not going to grow the fund. Uh, we're going to start funding broadband through uh, savings that come out of the existing program. Uh, we have a suggestion that, that, that happily some people that has been embraced to speed up the transition of this side to broadband through a one-time capital infusion. But this whole area is another complex area. And I'll say one thing about both of these areas, USF and Spectrum, that, um, uh, uh, that I think may be a correct way to think about this, but um, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. Um, there's a, 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 a book called Innovator's Dilemma by a Harvard Business School professor called Clayton Christensen. And the book looks at the question, uh, the challenge that market-leading companies face when disruptive technologies come along and disruptive competition comes along. And we just know, watching you know, the world over the last 20, 10, 20 years, that some market leaders uh, never survive that challenge from disruptive competitors. And, and some do. Some make the turn, they make the strategic decisions, and they continue to uh, succeed and, and often lead. Um, to me, the US right now is analogous to the kinds of companies that face innovators dilemma. You know, uh, we, the leading, uh, uh, the global leader in innovation and in the global economy in the 20th century, we're now facing a series of disruptive technology, uh, disruptive challenges, many from these new technologies, uh, new competitors around the world. And coming back to Christensen's book, one of the reasons companies fail in making the turn is that they have to deal with the realities of the business that they're in. And um, for various reasons, it can become much more difficult to shift to the new area being defined by the disruptor uh, than it is for a completely new entrant to do it. Well, that's the challenge I think that the US has in both the spectrum and the universal service areas, where in both of those areas, um, 
what we did in spectrum, what we did in telephone service in the 20th century helped make us a market leader. And in each of those areas, uh, uh, disruptive technologies, new competitors globally are coming along. And we have to now tackle these strategic challenges as a country, knowing that we really have to deal with a harder challenge than some of our competitors do, right? Some of our competitors looking at spectrum, looking at fiber, are working on a clean slate. And they can go directly to um, the platforms that make sense for the 21st century. We don't have that luxury. We actually have to transition from what we have uh, to where we want to go. So it's a harder challenge. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think whether we can do it as a country is a real test of whether, um, uh, you know, a, a, as a country, we can tackle these major strategic challenges, do what I think we know we need to do for the 21st century uh, so that we can maintain our leadership position in the 21st century. So let me, um, let me shift the focus a little broader. Again, picking up on a couple of questions also. My own experience, I'm curious for you. So um, I'm assuming that nobody ever comes to you at the commission and says, um, I really want you to do this because if you do it, I'll get a raise and I'll get a Porsche, right? Everybody has a public regarding argument. This is good for America. You should do this because this is gonna this is gonna make America great. So since everybody says that, how do you what metrics do you use in order to try to figure out which of these arguments are actually persuasive and which are not? Well, look, this is this is why uh, it's so important for the FCC to have uh, an expert staff. Um, filled with people from multiple disciplines uh, who are focused on facts and data, asking the right questions, uh, doing the right work to evaluate the record that, that, that comes in, uh, to help shape the record that comes in by asking the right questions and seeking the right data, and you know, doing the right thing based on, um, based on the record. But how data-driven driven realistically can you be? So let's, let's talk about I I incentive these incentive auctions. We haven't had them yet, right? So we actually don't know how much money they're going to raise. We don't know, to, to answer one of the questions, we don't know exactly you know, what percentage is going to go into broadcasters because they're going to put in their own bid and say, I'll happily get out for X amount of dollars. So we don't really know. This is an, this is an unknown mechanism. So how data-driven can you actually be there? You can be as data-driven as, uh, uh, for example, any company is when making a strategic decision about uh, the future. So, uh, you know, being data and fact driven doesn't mean setting as a bar that one has to know with 100% certainty exactly how the future will roll out. You need a sufficient basis to make a decision. The greater the disruption that the decision will cause, the greater the responsibility to clearly articulate uh, the costs and benefits of, of, of the action. But, I, you know, it's certainly something I learned in 10 years in the private sector. You have to make decisions every day based on facts and data that will have real consequences, and you rarely have perfect information, but you try to organize yourselves so that you've collected enough information to make very solid decisions. Uh, and, and I think, you know, having said all of that, I do think in, of all these areas in the spectrum area, this is one where uh, um, uh, I, I don't think it's a close call, right? So the hard things you have to deal with at, at, you know, uh, in government on these topics, and the same thing is true in business, is when you face a strategic decision and you look at all the facts and data and the arguments and you think, oh my God, this is a close call. And then, and then you know, then someone goes and flips a coin, I guess. But, um, uh, but this is not one of those decisions, in my opinion, when it comes to uh, the various things we need to do to unleash spectrum uh, for the years ahead. But there are going to be some things that do involve regulatory philosophy, right? So would, it be, would we be better off with uh, kids watching more or less television? or more educational programming or, or whatever, where the data are gonna only take you so far and you are gonna have to, and, and regulatory philosophy is gonna come into play. Right, but that's not, that question is not posed by the incentive auction idea um, uh, uh, at all, because uh, uh, one, broadcasters can continue to, to transmit. Um, we expect uh, most broadcasters will, um, uh, uh, you know, there are lots of, so there, so there are a set of issues uh, uh, potentially around content, but they have nothing to do, in my opinion, with uh, uh, the spectrum strategy that I've laid out. So I want to get back to the philosophy point, but just to pick up on one of the questions that... 
Except, I mean, in, you know, in one sense, um, on, but this is the opposite of what you're getting at. I think, you know, it's hard for anyone to watch uh, the world in the last few weeks and the last year and not understand the role that um, uh, uh, mobile communications through Twitter and, you know, Facebook mobile can play in uh, uh, connecting people, uh, organizing um, uh, uh, people around the world to participate uh, uh, in the future direction of their countries, so uh, you know, I think I think uh, uh, I don't think we have to quantify those public interest benefits in thinking about you know the pros and cons of this because I I, I think it's a separate issue. But there's no question that in in unleashing new technologies, in unleashing mobile innovation, in addition to driving our economy, creating jobs, making sure that the U.S. remains the leader in innovation. We're also uh, uh, unleashing new technologies that are having, uh, uh, you know, effects that uh, get measured well beyond um, uh, strictly the number of jobs created. So again, before I get back to this regulatory philosophy, just one question that, that came in: um, What does your plan do to the uh, the ten percent of Americans who don't subscribe to cable and satellite? So once we have all these incentive auctions. Th those those people who do rely on over-the-air broadcast, what happens to them? Well, um, uh, what we're assuming uh, uh, ha happens with an auction like this is that uh, uh, overwhelmingly uh, the most watched broadcast stations will say on the on, on the air. So the effect on uh, the relatively small number of viewers who only have over-the-air TV uh, would be very very modest. That's point number one. Point number two is. Um, we're spending all the rest of our time trying to move to universal broadband as quickly as we can. Uh, and so the more people who have broadband access, uh, the more people who will have access to video programming, including bro programming created by uh, broadcasters. Uh, and broadcasters, by the way, more and more are uh, thinking creatively uh, uh, about um, multi-platform strategies. And, you know, they understand that fewer and fewer people are watching TV the way they used to, and more and more people are um, uh, getting their video uh, on their uh, phones or on their tablets or on their laptops or on their computers. So, uh, you know, no broadcaster will succeed in the U.S. without having a multi-platform strategy. And again, a very big objective of ours is completely consistent with that, which is trying to make sure that uh, everyone in the U.S. has access to those other platforms. All right, so now let me let two questions be at war with each other. So the tenor of one is, uh, you're too regulatory. Uh, you should leave more to the market. And the tenor of the other is that you're insufficiently regulatory because we are watching various uh, local monopoly, you know, whether it's the local loop, although I'm not sure we, the local loop is quite as central as it was at telecom policy 15 years ago, but any variety of companies that we now see arming themselves with this incredible power so, as I said, I'll let these two. Com 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 so, so, are you? What wh what is this philosophy that you that, that you have when you, when you're trying to, to to negotiate between these two? You know, I it's it's a uh, it's an interesting observation. It's not the the level of generality at which I look at how we're doing. Right, I look at each of the challenges we have before us, and uh, work with the staff of the FCC to try to make the best decision. Uh, in each area that we're looking at. And in some cases, that may result in uh, an action that doesn't go as far as some people want. And in some cases, that may result in an action that goes further than some people want. Uh, uh, we've been blessed with decisions that have had both attributes to them, uh, that people at both extremes didn't like. I, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we have an institutional responsibility uh, to, to look at hard questions, make the best decisions we can based on the record, based on facts and data. Um, and that's what we do. But just to just pick up on that and push that just a little bit further, right? But there are, you know, some people who say, look, the government should, should be playing a much more active role than it is now because the government really can be an engine for growth and it needs to be an engine for growth. And so it needs to have a much more proactive um, relationship, frankly, with businesses than it, than it has had. Well, I'm not sure what proactive relationship with businesses that means. That means regulatory. Uh, oh, I'm not sure how I'm not sure that's how businesses would define it. Look, we're uh, uh, 
where government can make a positive difference in meeting public interest objectives like contributing uh, to our economy, um, uh, contributing to uh, our capacity for innovation, uh, contributing to a whole series of public interest objectives that people can discuss, uh, government should act. When uh, 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 what government would do would have the opposite effect, it shouldn't act. And with respect to every issue that, uh, that we face, we ask ourselves that question. Um, all right, so I have a couple of wild card. These are mine, my wild card questions. So what's been the most fun part of the job? What's been the most fun part of the job? I think the most fun part of the job has been uh, working with people from different backgrounds and disciplines. Uh, uh, and I think this is probably why I was attracted to the FCC 15 years ago when I first uh, went there. That, that um, uh, you know, I, 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 I was very lucky growing, growing up. My... my uh, I was lucky because I'm here, because you know my parents are immigrants and my family survived the Holocaust, so I was like lucky just to be here at all. But I was also lucky because my my father came here to be an engineer, uh, and so uh, and, and early in my career, I spent most of my time doing science and math, and eventually got into you know journalism and did a bunch of different things. In any event, I, I feel very lucky because I've, I, um, uh, over the course of the early part of my career, I was exposed to a lot of different things, and. Um, when I was trying to figure out what to do, and this is a you know, law school audience, so after I went to law school and finished clerking, when I was trying to figure out what to do, um, most of my friends were, were doing things like uh, uh, going to teach. Nothing wrong with that, or, you know, uh, uh, no, I, nothing at all wrong with that, or, you know, or going to, uh, uh, to law firms, often in appellate practices. Um, the ones who were going into government, you know, tended to go to the Justice Department. Um, and, uh, and I had the strange idea that it might be fun to go to the Federal Communications Commission because of this point, because it was uh, not only about really interesting legal issues, and there are really interesting uh, legal issues, uh, but also because it's about technology, it's about economics, uh, it's about business, it's about uh, ways to materially affect uh, uh, the quality of education in the United States, healthcare, energy, public safety, and to me, the opportunity to engage on that series of topics with people um, who come out of each of those areas uh, and also who have different uh, disciplinary backgrounds, engineering, technology, whatever. To me, that's just great. And so the meetings I enjoy the most are the ones where we have around a table, uh, this is going to sound like a joke, but it's not, you know, an economist, a lawyer, a technologist, and, and, um, but we're really, you know, uh, uh, arguing and, and debating uh, what the right answer is, how to analyze it, um, and what we can do to most benefit uh, the public. And, uh, and what has surprised you the most? Um, what surprised me the most? Um, uh, I, I think what surprised me the most is that uh, 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 not everyone else engaged in policy making uh, 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 has that point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to elaborate on that? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so when you think about the, now back to a couple of these questions. So when you think about the, that the, prior, the priorities has as the, as the commission goes forward, um, look, we live in the, we, you know, we, 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 live in the, we, we live in the world of the possible, and there are lots of constraints that are imposed by political realities, what, you know, what Congress is, is, is willing to do. Um, are there things that are, that are on your agenda that you say, boy, it would really be great if the stars could align and I could do X, Y, or Z? Well, I think they're the things that, that we've been talking about. Uh, uh, transforming our spectrum policy uh, to make sure that uh, we are where we need to be, uh, transforming this big multi-billion dollar a year program called the Universal Service Fund, um, uh, thinking creatively about, you know, and each of these things includes a lot of other stuff. So Spectrum includes both license and unlicensed. Uh, uh, it includes both thinking um, about how we can, um, in both of these areas, uh, uh, significantly, can we significantly change in a positive way the economics around broadband build out? So we can get more build out faster to more places, and uh, you know, certainly there are people who are in the job of bringing, building out infrastructure who say that it's uh, 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 by virtue of you know various processes that they have to go through, it's more expensive, more time-consuming than it should be. 
And we see some of this, a lot of this around uh, uh, tower siting. So here's a challenge for the country. Um, uh, for consumers, for users of mobile services to be able to take full benefit of 4G smartphones and tablets and machine to machine devices, um, we're going to need more towers in the country than we have now. And, um, and we're going to need them relatively quickly if we want uh, the benefits of a robust, of robust mobile communication sooner rather than later. That's a real challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge that needs to be met in part by uh, people who do the towers getting more and more creative about what towers and antennas can look like. Uh, 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 um, uh, and also uh, on the part of the various authorities that have to approve tower requests, uh, or even in particular co-location requests, to uh, take a fresh look at how they're doing it. So one of the challenges that um, appears to be a very real challenge out there that we're looking into very seriously is um, the amount of time it takes a company to add an antenna to an existing tower. You'd think that that would be the easiest thing of all. Um, but there are stories of even something like that taking 18 months um, and being an unnecessarily painful process. Well, that's uh, another thing that we can tackle. For and regulatory it, reasons. Yes, for regulatory reasons. Um, uh, you know, our, our national broadband team estimated that uh, a couple of points, that these kinds of, of costs um, make up about 20% of the cost of building out broadband infrastructure, and that if uh, uh, all the ideas that were suggested were adopted, it could lead to about uh, a reduction of about a third of the cost in that, um, which is material if we're looking to uh, promote faster, uh, broader broadband build out. There are other ideas too in this area that, that become important. There's a great idea called Dig Once. Um, you know, just adopting as a national policy that anytime anywhere in the country a road is being repaired, that we lay fiber at the same time. Because the uh, uh, most expensive part of the cost of rolling out fiber is actually digging up the road. So it's a great idea. It's an idea that's been around for uh, at least a year. It hasn't been uh, adopted as broadly as it should be. It should be. All right, so my last question. I think I might be over my time, but my last question. So as you know, there's a bunch of law students in so is there anything that you that you would that you would have wanted to have heard you would want to hear if you were a law student? You know now that mm. you would want to be telling them to say, hey, you know, this is the thing you should be thinking about as you go through your law school career. Well, I guess from my experience, just to come back to the story I told about how I ended up at the FCC, uh, you know, uh, be um, be expansive about what your options really are. Uh, uh, and um, you know, consider, I would say that the FCC, when, when, you know, when I went to the FCC, it certainly was a non-conventional choice. I think since then, uh, maybe it's become a little more conventional. I don't really know. But I would encourage all of you, listen, if you're at a place uh, like this incredible law school, by definition, uh, you've earned uh, a strike or two uh, before you strike out. And, uh, and use it. You know, take a chance on doing something that you think uh, may not have 100% of working out, but could be, you know, your real calling and the most fun that you have. Because I, I'm just telling you, if you if you if you graduate from this law school, uh, and the first thing you try doesn't work, you'll have other chances. All right. On that note, thanks very much to. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.